with the shell. Disability result from barriers facing people with disability. Now, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability puts it clear when it indicates that disability actually is the way society responds. And the way society responds has been a long-term creation in the way that we act towards people with disability. Now, having said that, does it mean that society in itself is a barrier that people with disabilities face? To answer that question, I'm going to share with you my experience with the women who suffer in silence. Now, a woman with deafness has a disability faces a big risk of being a victim of violence, be it sexual, physical, or emotional than any other woman or person with disabilities. Uh, during my work as a coordinator of the Disability Rights Fund at United Deaf Women's Organization, I've had one of the most strenuous experiences with the story of a young deaf woman called Daisy. Daisy was one of the recipients of our scholarships at UDO and we have gotten her a place in Chereka Rehabilitation Center to do vocational studies. Now, Daisy had been living with her parents for over 17 years without attending any form of education. However, two months into vocational school, the head teacher told us that there was a problem with Daisy. You see, Daisy had been found to be pregnant. And so in essence, she had lost her place in school because Government schools in Uganda don't allow students who are pregnant to stay in school. So the big one of hope for Daisy had gone down just when she had just gotten it. So however, when we went to pick Daisy from school, she kept on insisting that she wasn't pregnant. And at first I thought that maybe she was afraid of losing her scholarship or she was afraid of facing her parents. So when we went back to Udoda where we, like, we got Daisy, and we talked to the mother, she told us that actually what Daisy was saying was right. She wasn't lying. Yes, she was pregnant, but she didn't know that she was pregnant. You see, because Daisy had lived in, she had been living in isolation with the mom for so long, she didn't get any chance to learn anything because they couldn't communicate. Her mother didn't know sign language. She also didn't know sign language. So they basically survived on a few skills. I want some food, I want to go to the toilet, and that was all. So Daisy didn't learn anything. And at that moment, I started reflecting back in my own life. When I was growing up, my older sister used to love the soap called Rivera. So sometimes when she was watching, I would wander in the TV room, and sometimes I would find an intimate scene, and immediately she would put her hand over my face or tell me to look her until the scene got over. And so after some time, it really became natural for me that whenever I was in the TV room and such a scene came on, my hand would automatically come and cover my face. <laughs> Though sometimes gradually I would just peep with one finger to see what exactly was happening. So by the time that I studied about reproductive health and sex and everything in school, I pretty had a good idea of how a baby, you know, reaches the womb. And perhaps you've had similar experiences with your daughters. I mean, you reach that time when you have to give that girl talk to your daughter so that she can transition through adolescence properly. Now, these are stages that Daisy missed. So after explaining to her and demonstrating what had happened and what was in store for her, Daisy frankly started explaining what had happened. She told us that when she was coming from the shop back home, a man grabbed her, put her hands behind her back, took her in the bushes near her house, removed her clothes and forced himself on her. Of course, at that moment, Daisy didn't even know what was happening. She just froze because it was an experience that she didn't know or even realize what was happening to her. 
so from that moment we realized that the best thing that we can do for Daisy at that moment in time was to make sure that she gets justice. So with information about this man, we went to arrest him. Unfortunately, as the fate would have it, when we reached his home, we found him on his deathbed. He was dying, literally. But this man wasn't just dying. He was dying of HIV AIDS. So from that moment, I realized that Daisy was in a catch-22 predicament, and I couldn't see any way out for her. Now, the reason why these women are vulnerable to HIV AIDS is because from the time that they are born, they have low self-esteem. This is fueled by the negative culture practices that we have in our society. They demonize deafness and they look at it as an avenging spirit or some kind of curse. And sometimes it's due to negligence or overprotection of the parents. So this is what Daisy was facing at this moment in time. However, the most immediate cause of deaf women's vulnerability to HIV AIDS is actually their lack or limited power to negotiate for safer sex. And this is coupled by the lack of female control HIV prevention methods, apart from the female condom, which is not easily available in the mountains in Bukuda or to the most poor in the villages. One other story that struck me was a deaf woman who described to me her nasty experience when she went to the hospital. She went to ask for condoms because in that health center, she heard that they were giving free condoms. So when she reached the consultation table where she found the nurse, the nurse was the first person to get shocked. She actually went and called her friends and said, come and see this deaf woman asking for a condom. Imagine who loves her. I mean, does it mean that when I'm deaf, the rest of my body doesn't work? And even parents, sometimes the parents of the deaf don't know the same language. So they can't help their children through education or even guide them during the process, like in the case of Daisy. And even society. Society has come to dismiss anything that is related to poverty, sexual violence, and disability. Most people will say, those things don't happen here. Others will say, those things happen to those people because they made bad choices in life. So you find that the lenses are focused on the individuals. So the triple stigma of poverty, sexual violence, and disability, it put a strenuous, tremendous power on the victims and survivors, and they end up not receiving the services that they need. Now, gender mainstreaming or advocacy is not a one-size-fits-all endeavor. Actually, in most cases, there is no one technique that can work for any group of disabled persons or even the community. It should be the voices and the experiences of the victims and survivors like Daisy and the community like you are here today to be able to guide every step of the way. Now, Nelson Mandela, one of the greatest leaders in this world, may he so rest in eternal peace. He said, we are not fighting an individual. We are fighting a principle, a principle of apathy. You see, apartheid had become a barrier to all blacks in South Africa. And so when Nelson Mandela overcame discrimination, he was able to overcome that barrier. He was able to change the way society responds. Now, in the beginning, I told you that disability is the way society responds. So today, I want to tell each and every one of you that it can be the beginning for you. Tomorrow, when you meet a deaf person, don't be afraid to say hi. Or if you find them beautiful, go ahead and tell them you look beautiful. Because tomorrow, it will be your daughter, it will be your son, it will be your husband, who will be faced with a disability.
And like we say in the deaf culture, 